On today's episode, I'm joined by senior ballistician Jaden Quinlan, and we're talking bullet dispersion. If you've ever wondered why all of your shots don't go in the same hole, then you will find this podcast particularly educational. We hope you enjoy. I'm Joyce Hornady. You might say accuracy is my business. I make bullets. You are listening to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Hornady Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Swerzik. And today, Jaden, I'm sorry, but everybody likes to hear it. Uh, Quinlan's Corner. I, I, I hate to I hate to bring that up again. I guess I'm just going to have to live with it at this point. At this point, it's it's a thing. Yeah. Uh, people, you know, it's trade show season. We're here in pretty near February. Mm-hmm. And we've done a couple trade shows already. And we've got people coming to the booth saying, oh, we love listening to Quinlan's Corner. So Yeah, it's pretty cool. We got Preston to blame for the the naming, yeah. but uh, the information that we're putting out or that you are, are putting out is being pretty well received so cool. far. And, uh, you know, we just got most recently back from SHOT Show, and I'm not sure you're always in meetings. On the show floor, we had a lot of people talking. Did anybody stop you in the hallway or anything? Uh, not, on the, not in the hallway. Fortunately, I couldn't, like, trap me in an elevator. Yet. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm sure it was the the guys that are mad on YouTube at me that would have caught me in there. But oh, uh, sure. uh, no, a couple people came in the booth and that was honestly a really cool experience. So for somebody that's essentially been in love with ballistics and, and the learning of it for quite a long time, to meet other people that share that passion or interest is always cool. Right. But to hear that you were able to help somebody is even, even more cool, you know? So yeah. um, that was much appreciated, those of you that stopped by. Yeah. And it's pretty gratifying to get the recognition that not only did they enjoy it and whatever, but that they were able to internalize it and apply it and like connect the dots. Mm-hmm. And, you know, sometimes if you're talking or explaining or trying to teach somebody something and it's not going through, you know, as the teacher, it's hard to not think, okay, well, I'm miscommunicating this or I'm not doing a good enough job with, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. And it's nice to see that it's, it's hitting home. So, yeah. To continue on that, before we get into, you know, we've got a couple more podcasts that we need to record on, terminal performance being one of them, Mm -hmm. but uh, this one I'm looking forward to, and I'm confident our listeners will like this as well, because uh, 11-year-old Seth, laying in the hayfield, assumed that every 257 Robert shot was going to go in the same hole if I did my part, Mm -hmm. which I, obviously, it never went in the same hole, (laughs) and... uh, uh, I just thought you know it was a bad shot, and I needed to get better. And I had this assumption that I was basically shooting a laser beam, yep. and that any uh, influence to the dispersion was from me. Mm-hmm. Obviously, that's incorrect. And yeah, you know, eleven-year-old Seth grew up and and learned otherwise. But uh, you brought this idea up to record, and I think it's a great one because I think not that everybody has that preconceived notion maybe when they're 11 but uh to to really dive into what is dispersion we've been talking about it and how to quantify it and and what have you and you know just recently you were on uh eric cortina's podcast believe Mm -hmm. the target and uh cleared up some things and and as it turns out you guys were really just on the same page and it was just seemingly a battle of semantics and once you kind of hash that out you realized not you but you know we realized that you know we're in a precision sport that that is uh you know blends a lot of things and the pure precision sports like f class and bench rest we're we're after a lot of the same things sure and uh you mentioned in that podcast specifically we have to be clear about what we're trying to define well let's let's define dispersion let's go into that yeah um this i'm really excited for this one kind of for the same reasons you reasons you opened with you know you grew up here in nebraska i was in southern colorado we had no idea that we were kind of doing the same things at the same time, but I distinctly remember it was around Thanksgiving and there was a, like a Turkey shoot, some sort of like ad hoc shooting competition. And at the Turkey shoot, they had a egg shoot challenge. So they had the cardboard box and they had like tied a string to an egg. And I think it was at 200 yards. I might might be wrong. Um, but it was one of those things where it was like a five dollars to shoot at the egg. You do it as many times as you want, and whoever hit it, it was like you know, half the money went to you, half went to a 
uh, charity or whatever it was, yeah. something like that. Okay. Well, young Jaden thought, boy, I'm going to save the farm. Like, I'm, I'm getting the shooting stuff figured out. I got my 22 mag. I'm pretty good with it, you know? And uh, I'm going to go smack this egg and, and bring the money home to the farm. Well, I had observed that dispersion existed, just like you said. All my bullets didn't go in the same hole. I didn't know why. I assumed, same thing as you, I assumed it's me. Like, I've been told, I remember hearing um, that this rifle is zeroed for this person, and if I pick it up, it'll have a different zero. And I kind of just took it for what it was worth because it came from a authority figure or a mentor, but it never made any sense to me. And I've always wanted to know why. I mean, that's this passion in ballistics. I right. constantly tried to dig down deeper to understand why. So at 100 yards, I'd see that 22 mag gr- it would, you know, pattern. It created grouping. And I thought, well, I tested it. And at 100 yards, it would group like inside of the size of an egg. So I should have this thing nailed, you know, like, yep, I'm yeah. going to win this. And I show up and I missed and missed and missed. I think I ran out of my gas. I was like tapping into gas money at yeah. that point. It's like, <laughs> okay, got to cut this off. But that was my first uh, observation that dispersion got bigger as a function of range. You know, I had shot enough rounds at the exact same thing over and over and over. I was able to see it. But down the road, um, when I started to understand these principles that we'll talk about today, it was such a relief because, <laughs> because I felt all those years, I felt responsible for the misses, right? If the bullet doesn't go in the same hole, it's my fault. I did something wrong. I didn't pull the trigger right. My eye relief was wrong. My parallax was wrong. My aiming error, right? Those things that involve me are the whole source of why that bullet went where it went. So when I learned this information, I was able to defer responsibility, and it yeah, felt really good. That always feels good. <laughs> yeah, have a finger to point. Now, I'm, I'm a huge advocate for taking responsibility, so that's just for fun. Um, but if we think about that a little bit, so we know some things vary, right? Uh, velocity variation is a, a super easy one. So yeah. I remember looking to that early on, saying, well, I, I didn't have a chronograph or anything way back in those days, but, but that information has been published for a very long time. Pick up a gun magazine, and you know, you'll see it. And so I remember um, an early ballistic calculator coming out. This was back when it was like only desktops and it was dial-up internet and AOL, yeah. you know. And uh, I somewhere, somewhere downloaded some ballistics calculator. I can still see the graph. I, I don't know what software it was or what it was. But anyway, I thought, well, maybe it's this velocity thing. And I remember playing with different velocity numbers. And that didn't make it add up either. Um, yeah. I, I ran some numbers before we came up here. So like a 6.5 Creedmoor. Uh, 24 inch barrel doing 2700 foot a second if the velocity is 100 foot different drops down to 2600 that's worth 0.2 inches at 100 yards oh wow a quarter inch my groups are way bigger than that so velocity isn't accounting for it. is it just that i'm that bad and, and the answer here is no and we're going to go through the reasons why and all of this information this is you know not discovered by us here this is out there open source you can find it all over but it's typically hard to digest sure um and it's probably not well assembled. You might learn about uh, some problems uh, with with the bullet mm-hmm. and and w- how a bullet influences dispersion. And then you know, completely unrelated on an entirely different path, you'll find something about the barrel and chamber interaction and all that. But to get a a single source yeah. of this information, you know, we just recently had Jeff Seward on our podcast with mm-hmm. ammunition demystified. I think a lot of this is covered in that as well. Yeah, in great detail. Yeah, uh, that would be a good source for it. But there's, you know, there's a lot of these discoveries were made at the government level within the last, oh, 70 to 80 years, you know, or, or at least the publications that, that brought them out um, that are available now. You can find them on the internet. Um, a lot of that came out of that realm. But uh, the other thing here is, here's my disclaimer. I, I, I'm going to try to describe these things in analogies that hopefully help somebody that doesn't understand this stuff understand it. So if you're already aware of these principles, if you've read, you know, DTIC articles or you've read Seward's book or you've read the first 100 pages of the Hornady Handbook, which talks about some of this stuff, if you already have access to that information, you're aware of it, I hope you find this informative and, and entertaining. But really, I think my goal is to help 11-year-old me and you, yeah. you know, and, and give that insight. So. So let's start out. There's kind of, we'll, we'll go to three categories of problem here. We have problems with the bullet, just the bullet alone by itself. 
we have problems with the bullet and the barrel and how they interact with each other. And then we have problems with how the bullet comes out the end of the muzzle. So those will kind of be the three categories we'll talk about. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about the bullet first. Yeah. Um, I mean, you've read the first hundred pages in there. There's some kind of old pictures, probably from like the eighties or nineties that yep. show, uh, that show what is called CG offset, center of gravity offset. Yeah. Um, and so what that is, is as we make a bullet, you're taking, you know, the jacket material, uh, usually starts as a strip and it's made into like a cup or like a bowl. And then that gets drawn up, um, in the bullet making process. That's kind of well established. Now, as, as that's drawn up, if the material of the jacket does not move the same way, you might get more material on one side of the bullet than the other. So it's more thin on one side and thicker on the other. Well, then when you go to put the lead core in there, the lead core is pretty heavy. Um, and, and if the jacket is thicker on one side and thinner on the opposing side, it's going to take that core and push it off to one side of the bullet from its shape perspective, yeah, right? The center essentially the making it heavier on one side than the other. That's right. And so uh, CG offset is what that is. Now there, there's, and we're going to go into that one on detail, but there's another problem that bullets can have just by themselves, and that's um, asymmetric shape. So this would be if the ogive or that, that nose of the bullet was sitting on it crooked, mm. right? Like the, the bearing surface, the straight section, and the boat tail, those two were perfectly aligned with each other, but the ogive was on crooked, or if the boat tail was crooked. So that would be like a problem with your tooling that you're using to make the make the bullet. Yeah, it's right? on the manufacturer's end. On the manufacturer's end. So yep. those are the two main problems. Now the asymmetric shape one, I'd say that one's pretty much gone. Yeah. Um, you know, you have measurement tools available uh, in manufacturing, really ad advanced measurement tools where you can essentially rule that out. You can just measure it. So if it's present, you can go and fix it and get it to essentially right. go away. There's, there's probably some element of it that's always there, but it's so small at this point with modern manufacturing that we'll we'll leave that one there we won't even really be concerned about it okay but the cg offset guy he's pretty much always present to some extent or another now some sometimes you'll hear that you can get away with that with like a, a monolithic like a lathe turned bullet because it's all the same material so you're not taking um you know the the jacket material that's of lesser lesser density and putting the core in it of higher density and that's what's causing it to happen it's all the same so it, it can't be off um, there's some other issues that can come from that. We won't delve down into those uh, details. But um, so page page 13 through 30 of that Hornady handbook has those images. So if you have that book, it'd be a great yeah, resource for it. Um, I'm going to try to describe this whole thing without visual aids. So we'll see how that goes because <laughs> okay. we've been yelled at before for that. Yeah. Um, so there's some, there's some kind of cool things that happen with the CG offset thing. So the first thing is as the bullet's in the barrel and it's traveling down the barrel, we know that... Uh, the acceleration of the bullet in the barrel is not linear. So it doesn't start from zero and come out of the muzzle at, you know, 2,600 and halfway through it's at 1,300. That would be linear. It's not that. It kind of ramps up. Um, and so as the bullet's going down the barrel, it's engaged by the rifling, engraved by it, and that's causing it to, to rotate, right, right, in the barrel. So... An easy analogy for this is a car tire that's out of balance. The bullet's out of balance because the heaviest, you know, high density part of the bullet is shifted off to one side more than the other. Yeah. Well, the bullet is going to go into the barrel if it engages straight, engraved straight. It's going to, to rotate and the center line of the bullet should be pretty well aligned with the center of the barrel. If our center of gravity is offset from that because the core is more to one side than, than the other, that center of gravity is just going to kind of wobble around the center of rotation. Yep. Well, when you drive a car and it has an out-of-balance wheel, you feel it, right, as a vibration. Mm -hmm. Well, the interesting part there in that analogy with a car wheel, the tire is attached to the axle via the hub or shafts or however you want to look at it on the center of that wheel, right? So when that vibration occurs, you can even see it in an axle, right? Like if the, if the out-of-balance was severe enough, the whole thing shimmies, right? Well, a, a bullet and a barrel are the same thing. It's just instead of... Uh, instead of the tire being held on the center by the axle, it's the bullet holding or the, the right bullet point. being held by the outside mm -hmm. by the barrel. But the same thing happens. So as that bullet center of gravity is wobbling around the center of rotation, there's some vibration occurring. An, uh, another way to think about this would be the bullet's trying to throw itself out of the side of the barrel as, it, as it's doing that. Mm -hmm. 
Well, as you progress down the barrel, the bullet is accelerating at a faster and faster and faster rate. That means it's going to be rotating at a faster and faster and faster rate. Well, what happens when you have an out of balance tire and you drive faster and faster and faster? More and more and more the wob- Yeah, the wobble changes, right? It gets worse. The same thing is going to happen with the bullet in the barrel. So as it's going down the barrel, whatever center of gravity offset it has and that that wobble or it trying to throw itself out the side of the barrel is going to get you know stronger, you could, I guess, say for very simple terms. Mm-hmm. And so that's interesting because what that means is the barrel, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit of detail here in a minute, is just a big tube <laughs> that can move around, yeah. right? I mean, it's a, it's a, uh, just a hole through the whole thing. So as that thing is vibrating, if it vibrates worse and worse and worse and worse towards the muzzle, well, the further you get towards the muzzle, the farther you get from any support that the thing has. It's, it's screwed into the receiver back there, and that's the only thing that's, that's holding on to it. So the fact that the, the wobble gets worse down bore is interesting from the harmonic standpoint. Some people will have heard of that. So that's part one of CG offset is that it can cause the barrel to kind of move around. The second part is once the bullet comes out of the muzzle with CG offset, once the bullet is not constrained or held by the barrel anymore and it comes out, the bullet's going to rotate around the center of gravity. Well, if that center of gravity is not aligned with the center of form or the center shape of the bullet, yep. that means that the, the bullet's going to, the shape of the bullet kind of wobbles around a bit. And, and some people will have heard that term that the bullet wobbles around um, more technically defined by the the tricyclic arm i think mccoy put that out in modern exterior ballistics um so so that's kind of problem one is this the cg problem let's start to go to the barrel now because now we're going to have barrel bullet interaction that's going to happen okay so so the center gravity offset is is one the next one is what we'll call um the tilt of the bullet or the ability for it to be crooked in the barrel call it principal axis tilt or, or PAT for short. So as the bullet is leaving the cartridge case neck, so the, the primer is ignited, the, the flash comes through the flash hole, that, so that would be you know, flaming particulate, I guess you could say, hits the propellant bed. It's going to hit the back of the propellant bed first. There's going to be some pressure associated with that. A primer generates pressure. And it's going to take the propellant bed and push it forward at first. Now, it's also starting to burn, too. So the ratio of those two to each other is, is interesting. Um, there's not a whole lot of information out there on it. But that's going to cause the bullet to start moving out of the case neck. Now, once it leaves the case neck or the case neck has let go of it radially, right? enough pressure has built that the, the case neck has expanded out to the walls of the chamber, and now the bullet's not held by it anymore something along those lines is occurring usually the bullets out of the the case neck because when you take a fired cartridge case and you look at it you'll see that there's carbon kind of on the neck but then it yeah. stops at the shoulder and it's nice and clean obviously like a, a semi-automatic especially a gas impingement style gas gun that's okay. going to skew that a little bit yeah. and then if you throw it's a dirty suppressor everywhere. on it yeah it gets dirty everywhere but let's just say with a bolt action you you observe that right it's kind of dirty on the neck so that would indicate that there's, there's gas escaping um, around the mouth of the cartridge case and, and getting the neck dirty at the point where the shoulder's getting sealed up. So once it leaves that case neck and it gets into the free bore or the throat area, that essentially free run area that the projectile has before it starts to engrave into the rifling, we've talked about this before, that that diameter is critical. Yeah. Um, so that bullet could tip in that diameter a certain amount and, yeah. and that amount is defined by the, the dimensions of that portion of the chamber um at the same time pressure is building right because the powder is burning as all this is happening so pressure is building and it's well documented that uh, a barrel a pressure vessel is going to respond to that pressure it's going to to swell outwards a little bit and the amount you know probably who knows it depends on all kinds of different variables yeah. Probably not much. A few tenths, I would guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the the heavier profile barrels probably happen less too than a very light barrel. The amount of pressure, the timing of that pressure, all that stuff is going to play into exactly how much. Let's just, you could say, a half thou or less maybe. Okay. But 
that getting bigger means there's more clearance for the bullet. Again, that bullet can tip within those limits. How much it tips when it engages into the rifling um, is going to influence essentially the angle that it gets stuck at as it begins to rotate down the barrel. Another thing I think might could happen, I don't know for sure, is as that's occurring and you get that little bit of um, swelling of the barrel or, or growth radially, I think it's entirely possible that a piece or, or a propellant granule could become wedged on one side and sure. not the other and cause it to kind of be at an angle. Um, but that's, that's kind of the first point where the, angle, the principal axis tilt can come from is that angle. And then as it goes down bore, if your bore dimensions aren't very consistent all the way down, so you have big spots and loose spots, yep. um, you probably felt like cleaning a barrel sometimes. Oh, you yeah. feel that. Like if you have a good um, tight uh, jag. jag or yeah. brush, you can feel those tight and loose spots. Yep. So it could happen in bore too. It might start nice and perfectly straight, but halfway down the barrel, the, the, the diameter start to get bigger and that bullet has more clearance because the jacket material gives, right? It's essentially scraped away by the lands. And so if it instantaneously gets bigger somewhere down bore, that bullet's going to move. It, it's too small not to. I guess the only way it wouldn't is if the pressure is still high enough at the base of the bullet that it causes it to obturate out and fill sure. back out. But, you know, halfway down bore, I, I doubt that's happening. Um, so it can happen in bore. Another thing that can happen there is like high levels of fouling. Oh, well, sure. So, so the old, um, oh, what word am I looking for? The um, carbon ring. The yeah. Carbon ring in, in, the, in the throat or that portion of the chamber, forcing cone area. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if that was really, really constricting from a diameter wise and it was really, really hard and the bullets shoved through that thing, it's almost like swedging, making the bullet smaller, you know, as, yeah. it, as it tries to engage into the rifling. Like you said, that jacket's going to give, the bullet's going to mm-hmm. change shape. Yep, and you can also see it from deposits down bore, not necessarily that infamous carbon ring that forms, you know, in that early rifling area, but down bore. If you had a, a rough spot in the barrel that was was getting copper deposits on it or maybe carbon buildup or something, and it became like a raised surface, it's entirely possible that, you know, as subsequent bullets go down, the the bullet is affected by that. It could be It could be tipped slightly. So it can happen in bore. And then at the muzzle is where it's really dangerous for it to happen. And I don't know if you remember that 6.5 Creedmoor barrel that uh, it didn't shoot very well. It was, I I think somebody um, got it for real cheap or something. Anyway, it wasn't acting like you would expect a 6.5 Creedmoor to act dispersion wise. Do you remember this at all? Uh, Did Miles work on it? I don't remember. It was a couple years ago, but we took, so we took uh, gauge pins. Oh yeah. Do you remember that? Yes. So, so this barrel didn't shoot very well. I mean, it was like, I don't know, a two minute barrel. And this is a match profile, right? Like kind of a, a should be a, a, a fairly good system and uh, shot like two minute five shot groups with, with the old standby 140 yieldy match with yeah. 41 and a half of 4350. Yeah. And so that's kind of weird. Yeah. So, <laughs> something's broken. Yeah. Um, and we, so we took some gauge pins, which are just a steel rod that are um, ground and controlled in their OD, their yep. diameter. We took those and we started fitting them in the barrel. And what we found was when one would just just slip in the muzzle, it would go down like, as like an inch and a half or two inches, and then it would stop. And so what that meant was that as, as, the, as you got closer to the muzzle, the the barrel belled out a yeah. little bit, like the old uh, blunderbuss, yeah. maybe, you know, bugled, crazy example. Yeah. Bugled muzzle. So what we did is we shot the barrel in that configuration quite a bit to get a good baseline of what it was capable of, and then we put it in the lathe, and we chopped it off, I think, a half inch deeper than where that gauge pin stopped, where we knew it got tighter, and that barrel uh, did much better after that. I don't remember what the exact number w- yeah. was, but there was a, a big improvement in its level of dispersion. So as that bullet is coming up to the muzzle and, and getting ready to uncork or come out the end of the muzzle, if that barrel is belled out at all, that bullet can really start to tip there. And another thing you can see, and I think it's pretty well understood in the bench rest world, that's the place I first remember hearing about it, was uh, the reason why the bench rest shooters never ran muzzle threads 
or a muzzle brake or suppressor or anything like that was because as you remove that material right there at the muzzle, if there is any residual stresses in the barrel steel at that time, when you remove that material, it may allow them to relieve themselves a little bit. And yep. if that meant that they opened up, now you have that same problem we just talked about. Yeah. And it, we did a podcast with Miles well, that was a while ago on, you might have been talking about custom rifle building. Could have been something else. Regardless, he explained some different barrel making procedures and how button rifle barrels would, uh, that the chances of that happening would be higher with a button rifle barrel. Mm-hmm. And, and again, because of how that material is displaced and then also how critical heat treating and stress relieving is on barrel steel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Just simply critical. Yeah. So any of those, you know, associated causes from the bullet coming out of the case neck and all the way to the muzzle being a little bit belled out, all of them causing the bullet to be able to tip off axis with the bore. If it comes out crooked from the case, from the muzzle. Mm. So as it comes out of the muzzle, if that bullet is crooked at, at yeah. any level, it's, it's less happy, right? Yeah. So uh, a perfect bullet would come out perfectly aligned. Um, so any level of tip that the bullet has, there's going to be a pretty dramatic response as the bullet comes out of the muzzle from a from an aerodynamics perspective. It's going to have a, a a larger yaw cycle, I guess you could say in simple terms, a wobble cycle or something. Um, should damp out, should go away, but there's damage done there from a point of impact standpoint sure. that is not undone. That, right. that jump that occurs is and then that would there. be compounded by the effects of a crosswind if it's has it a would. bigger yaw cycle. It definitely would. So so we've covered the asymmetric shape thing with the bullet, but we kind of said that's pretty well ruled out. The CG offset thing um, kind of makes the barrel go a little bit crazy. We covered a little bit of principal axis tilt, but we're still talking about bullet barrel interaction. And there's some really interesting things about the barrel itself. And there's a lot of studies that have been done um, by the government on this that you can find. And they're tough to read for the layman, yeah. you know, <laughs> tough to read for anybody. There's scientific articles. Yeah. So. Imagine the person who wrote it. Uh, yeah. Um, but what, what we have in the barrel is, uh, an easy example of this is a garden hose. Um, what's the main difference between a section of garden hose and a section of barrel? Steel. The material <laughs> yeah. kind of, right? They're both like a tube with a hole down the middle of them. So, uh, something that I've, always thought was interesting to observe was uh, so if you have a garden hose hooked up to a faucet and it's not like the turn knob style turn on thing it's like the lift handle one because you can get pressure right away right you know you go to max water pressure almost immediately with that yep and you have a hose and the hose has a little bit of curvature to it you crank that sucker on what does the hose do it's like a inflatable wacky arm flailing tube pan i was hoping you would say that because yeah. i don't remember that quote <laughs> <laughs> it, that's another ex- a perfect example you know as those things inflate the what was it inflatable wacky arm flailing tube man yeah those things when they inflate um you know they're flat on the ground they're just fabric yeah. but as you put air pressure into them they stand up and they 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 do their thing yeah they do their thing so a barrel if you think about it would have to do the same thing if there was curvature to the bore inside of the barrel and there almost always is because a barrel can't be made absolutely perfect right and a lot of people uh if you've ever had a barrel in a lathe to to chamber it or thread the muzzle where you dial indicate in on Mm -hmm. the on the ends of it you know obviously you can run an indicator rod down bore a certain distance to try to indicate in a little bit deeper but in general i think too that most barrels are contoured by being held on both ends and so what that means is is that the outside of the diameter of the barrel uh, the contour is being turned to the position of the bore at both ends not necessarily anywhere inside of there so it's entirely possible and, and well documented actually that the bore will will bend or jump rope or, or it will not be completely straight right so if if that hose is crooked and you let the water pressure in and it causes it to kind of get rigid and flip around a little bit it's reasonable to expect that a barrel would do the exact same thing. And in addition to that, um, that pressure that's being generated is, is happening. Your, your peak pressure that you reach is within the first couple inches of bullet travel into the rifle, usually. And so that would be a little bit different too, because that, that hose with the water in it kind of just gets whatever the max pressure is not instantaneously but pretty close to it right 
So there's a dynamic there that the pressure is, is in a rate of change as it ramps up to peak pressure. And then as the, as the bullet continues down bore and the volume is increasing behind the bullet at a faster rate than the propellant is generating gas and pressure, that pressure starts to drop off. And so there's a dynamic pressure event that's occurring in that barrel from that hose analogy perspective. So it's, a, it's way more complex than the wow. garden hose. That's just a simple example to, to maybe help understand. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, that's heavy duty right there. Yeah. Now, there's another problem that, that can happen with, with those two things in combination. So remember the CG offset thing, the bullet trying to throw itself out of the side yeah. of the barrel is one level of, call it, exciting the barrel or, or making the barrel move to some extent. And then you have the pressure aspect of it too. So, you know, the harmonics thing is discussed a lot and it's, it's certainly there. And there's a really interesting case, um, and I don't remember the name of the document, but the government was doing a study on a machine gun and it was automatic. So it had a, a gas port in the barrel. And uh, what they found was the, the barrel would, or the, during fully automatic fire, the firearm would string shots vertically. It would just, it would walk up. And, you know, a lot of people will have observed that with like a shoulder fired M4 or something, right? Yeah. But this was more than just the, the firearm rising, causing it. It was the barrel's motion that was causing it. What they found was that the gas escaping out of that one side, not, not other sides of the barrel, just out of one side, would cause a, call it an imbalanced load, and it would actually bend the barrel at that point and cause the shots to hit high. Wow. So that's kind of a cool example. That um, is pretty of that. Pretty wild. Yeah. So we we talked a little bit like on the sample size podcasts about bullet jump, right? We said in that test data that we had done, it didn't really show much difference. Um and definitely not as much as some of us might like to think, right? It was kind of the the, the gist of that information. But bullet, and we also said that we can believe that bullet jump does do things and, yeah. and could have a positive effect. Um, and this might be why, where as you change the, the bullet jump to the rifling, you're, you're changing quite a few things. One, you're changing, obviously, the distance to the rifling, but you're also changing the volume behind the bullet, and that's going to influence the pressure that's generated at the same point in time of the bullet's travel. And so what you may be doing there is if you find a sweet spot where from a seating depth perspective, things are actually better, you know, on a statistical basis, they are right. better. Um, it may be related to that. It may be that as you, as you seat the bullet deeper, you reduce the case capacity, but that is also offset by the additional free run that happens now to, uh, to the bullet where it starts to engrave into the forcing cone. That in most rifle cartridges will eclipse the reduction in case capacity. Uh, the trade-off point that I've seen is somewhere like near a, a 223 or 556, where with that, as you move the bullet in and out, nothing really changes much from a pressure and velocity standpoint. As you go up to like the magnums, um, it's more of a control point of the jump, like the amount of case intrusion doesn't really play into it. And then as you go to the other end of the, of the spectrum, like pistol stuff, yeah, you definitely see the opposite. Hyper fast powder. Yeah, where you seat the bullet deeper and pressure and velocity go up. So it could be that you're changing the amount of pressure that's present based on seating depth. You're changing the amount of pressure that's present when the bullet is engraving into the, into the rifle. That's possible. I think it's also possible that you're changing maybe the bounce pattern of the bullet off of the walls of the, the free bore section of the chamber mm -hmm. before it engraves. You know, I, I don't know the exact answer, but it's totally possible that those things are, are occurring in there. Sure. So I would, I would imagine that the, the benefits of seating depth are more in the principal axis tilt realm. Yeah. And I think that seems, well, and again, going back to the sample size, but I think that if that is occurring, that would be why on, traditionally designed chambers you push the bullet out to the lands generally see better accuracy mm -hmm. and then with the more modern design chambers some of them seem to benefit from more jump yeah you know uh, and that may be an indication of the the lower pressure that's present as the bullet's starting to engrave so we we talked about the bore straightness issue right which would be a, a manufacturing issue 
the other thing that happens uh, to greater or lesser degrees is the barrel drooping from gravity. Okay. Which, which seems a little weird. Well, I mean, barrels are heavy. strong. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that's also been pretty well documented that the barrel does droop with gravity. And uh, obviously to varying degrees based on sure. a whole bunch of details. Contour. And it's, it's, con- it's connected to the receiver, mm. one thread tenon, anywhere from, you know, 16 to 28 inches behind the end of the muzzle. Yeah. And so the issue with kind of all those different topics and how they, you know, maybe can be lumped into the harmonics discussion is that if the barrel's muzzle is moving around, that means it's pointing at different places when the bullet comes out. Because shot to shot to shot the bullet spends there's a variance in the amount of time that the bullet spends in the barrel so the high velocity shot probably going to mean that that bullet spent the least amount of time in the barrel going from case neck to coming out of the muzzle versus the slow shot so the fact that bullets are spending varying amounts of time in the barrel if that barrel is in a in a state of motion even if it's imperceptibly small from a vibration or, or harmonic standpoint that that would increase the level of dispersion that would be one of the reasons why the bullets aren't going in the same hole Um, now that barrel pointing variability can also kind of get clouded a little bit with the fact that we're humans that Mm. you and i don't always do our part sometimes right you know and we do mess stuff up and we have aiming error and all that human aspect lumped in that also causes barrel pointing variability it just may not be from the source of what we're talking about here but it has the same effect, right? The barrel's pointing. Yep. Now there's all, you know, it gets more detailed than that. There's cross velocity stuff that occurs with a barrel in motion when the bullet comes out and all that. I think we'll, we'll leave that aside. Um, if you want to dig into that, there's plenty of those articles to go dig into. Um, so, so that's a, that's an, an additional point to it. So we were talking about principal axis tilt. The other thing that commonly happens when a bullet has, tilt in bore is that the center of gravity is no longer aligned anymore either Mm. because by chance it could be that the point at which it tilts the that point in space uh is the center of gravity in which case you might be okay but i would say i wouldn't expect that very often yeah right so even if you have a perfectly made bullet but you're shooting it in a system that allows for a lot of principal axis tilt which some of that's controlled by the chamber design you can take a bullet that's very high quality or very good and shoot it in that system and it doesn't shoot very good because you're back to doubling up again. Not only is the bullet going to come out crooked, which causes its own sort of wobble issue, you could say, but also that's it's trying to throw itself out the side of the barrel, that same concept that we talked about earlier. So if you haven't get, got it to this point, this is there's a lot of stuff. It's pretty complex, yeah. right? There's a lot of things that are going on that 11-year-old you and I had no. no idea about. Um, so let's now move into the muzzle exit piece, which is where the bullet comes out of the muzzle. So at first, what you see happening is there's there's air in front of the bullet. When, you know, when it seals in, or, or engraves into the rifling and it's kind of sealed in the bore, there's a whole bunch of air in front of that to the end of the muzzle, right? Sure. So as that bullet is moving down the barrel, it's beginning to, to compress and push that air out the end of the muzzle. So the first thing that happens is you see this like, poof of air that that comes out right in front of the bullet and then as the bullet is coming out of the muzzle there's an interesting oh controversy maybe you could call it about the the muzzle conditions or the crown conditions and you'll hear varying degrees of people that say oh it doesn't matter at all i took a hacksaw to it and nothing changed to people that say oh yes absolutely it changes i think it i think it absolutely has an effect i think those that have done the maybe the hacksaw thing or something like that um what they saw was eclipsed by something else because i've done that i've taken you mm-hmm. know test barrels to the bandsaw cut them off done a, a reloading chamfering tool for the crown to remove the burr from the saw and then off i go to shooting mm-hmm. and there's been cases where i didn't see changes in dispersion from that the dispersion may have been large enough that so there was something else playing into it that eclipsed whatever changes were present from that. But what can happen is if you can, and you can imagine this, if, if the bullet's coming out and one of the lands sticks out farther than all the rest, then as the last piece of the bearing surface or the borele length of the bullet is, is coming out of the muzzle, 
it leaves the grip of, let's say it's a four, four group barrel, so we have four lands. It leaves the grip of three of the lands, but one of the lands is just a little bit longer and is still in contact there. As that bullet, as that bullet comes out, it's, it's being rotated by the, the driving force side of, of those lands, and then it loses the three. It's not necessarily, it doesn't, you know, accelerate in its rotation from there. It can't. But if that one is holding on to it, you can sort of envision how it can like tip the bullet, mm -hmm. right? Because there's a force still contacting the bullet on one side that's not contacting the bullet on the other sides. Yeah. So that can be bad because you can view that as the same way as the principal axis tilting. The, the bullet is, is being kicked crooked. So that's, that's one example. Another one is the control of the, the muzzle blast gas pressures. And this is well established. Um, those pressures that propelled the bullet all the way down the barrel are going to, to come out after the bullet, and there's going to be kind of a, a cloud or a, a bubble of them, and the bullet usually is caught within that momentarily. I mean, the bullet's in front of it, but as soon as it comes out, those gases are traveling faster than the bullet, and it kind of en encompasses the bullet for a second, then the bullet breaks, breaks through it. Okay. This is... You know, this is where you see like a muzzle break, the effectiveness of that, where it reduces the recoil, right? You're changing the direction of those gases to prevent as much of that rifle coming back into your shoulder. If those gases are not symmetric, meaning there's more gas on one side of the bullet than there is on the other, you can kick the bullet. And uh, a great example of this is like a uh, an A2 birdcage flash yeah. hider. Yeah. They're, they're well known to have that phenomenon. Now, it does it pretty consistently right because the the bottom of the muzzle brake is encapsulated but the top is vented so what happens is as that bullet comes out and that gas bubble call it coming out behind it it vents out the top but it still concentrates at the bottom and, and kicks the bullet in the vertical direction now it's consistent every time it's vertical every time as we tie as we tie all of this in to dispersion the problem is that there's inconsistency in each of these different variables so if we look at center of gravity offset as the bullet comes out of the muzzle and that wobble that's caused because it's going to rotate around its actual center of gravity and the form is kind of wobbling around where that center of gravity comes out the muzzle from an orientation perspective so like if you're looking at the base of the bullet as it's coming out the end of the barrel if the center of gravity is at the nine o'clock position versus the three o'clock position versus 12 or six or any of those in between right the response of the bullet to each of those is different. Same thing with the principal axis tilt. If the bullet is tilted in bore, does it come out with its nose pointed up, pointed down, pointed right, left, halfway between? Where? I mean, you essentially have an nearly infinite levels of, of clock orientation and right. combination that, that those things can come out in. So this is why you start to see the random nature of dispersion. You get one shot that's in the middle. Well, that shot might have had almost no center of gravity offset and almost no principal axis tilt and the any motion or cross velocity that the barrel was inducing on the bullet from all that stuff we talked about was in a position where the barrel was pointed perfectly at the center of the target trajectory included yeah uh to make it hit the center and then the next shot the bullet's coming down the barrel but that last shot left a little bit of a deposit of copper on this one land on one side and it starts nice and straight, just like the last one did. There's no principal axis tilt. It's also a perfect bullet. There's no center of gravity offset. And as it travels down bore, that little piece of material that's raised in the bore scrapes the one side more than the other and gives it a little bit of tilt. And now when the thing comes out of the muzzle, the nose is pointed down. And so its impact point is at the two o'clock position on the group. So you can see how this random nature starts to build. Yeah. Um, do you remember... Do you remember like in school when they'd give you the, the common, so it's like combination and permutation, like the combination problem where it's like you have a, an apple, an orange, and a banana, how many different ways can you oh, arrange that? Yep, yep. So most, most people hopefully that are familiar with that. So, uh, so if you run a, a combination calculation on that, and let's say that, so we discussed, we discussed kind of four main variables here, right? We have CG offset of the bullet. We have principal axis tilt we have barrel pointing variability regardless of what the source or cause is 
and we have muzzle exit variability, let's say the gas or whatever caused the bullet to kick. So those four things, right? And we can have, let's break it down very simply to good and bad of each of those four. So I'd make eight of them. You could have good center of gravity, meaning whatever center of gravity offset it had was beneficial from a dispersion standpoint. It caused it to, to hit closer and you could have bad. And you could say that for all four of those, you have eight possibilities, right? Eight different pieces of fruit. If you run that through a combination calculator, it spits out 70. So what that means is you could have 70 different combinations of those eight things when you pick four of them. Because you're only going to pick four, right? It's either going to yeah. be good or bad, yeah. and it's going to be one of each of those that occurs as the bullet goes down the barrel. So there's 70 different possible combinations just with those four. And I'm not saying those are the only four. Right. There's a little more to it than that. So you can start to see why, like in, in the sample size podcast, why it kind of makes sense that when you shoot more, you get a better picture of what things are capable of. Because you're, of those 70 possible outcomes we're talking about here, you're, you're measuring more possibilities of them. If you only do a couple, you're just randomly picking yeah. a couple. And, it's, and you might get goods all the way across the board and think you're just yeah, right as the mail. You might, yeah. And so that's, that's kind of the, I hope, the good timing of this podcast. So I'm sure like five years from now, if somebody listens to this, they're not going to understand the context of the recent podcasts we've released and sure. some of the questions that have come out about them. Um, but that information is, I don't think I've stopped talking for like 45 minutes. No, you barely great. said anything. I know, it's fantastic. Um, but it's so cool to me because this problem is everywhere all the time. Mm -hmm. When I shoot pistols, it's there. When I shoot, you know, a, a vintage rifle with iron sights, it's there. When I shoot the, the field style PRS rifle, it's there. Bentrest, F-Class, it's there. It's there everywhere. These things are happening and to varying degrees and sure. there's all kinds of differences of the system and stuff, but it's like a universal dispersion is universal. So getting the answer to why I missed that egg <laughs> yep. when I was 11 is, is really cool. And I hope, uh, hope that helps people. I think, I think it will. And I think it's nice to have, you know, it's like paying somebody else to do your taxes. It's nice to have a finger to point, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it wasn't uh, my fault. Yeah, exactly. I had a tax guy do it. So <laughs> in this, in this scenario, it's nice to have, uh, to see this and begin to open your eyes and and to start accepting reality that yeah quarter minute rifles are few and far between and and it's nicer to have a realistic look at what you and your system are capable of when you do everything perfect mm -hmm. these things are at play and yep. you have you you have some control at the beginning you know you can choose a heavier contoured barrel a cut rifled barrel mm -hmm. uh, a high quality you know aftermarket barrel hopefully he's going to be a little bit more straight than you know something on the budget end um you can have really good chamber dimensions you know you can order a reamer or you know shoot a cartridge that uh, has a, a reamer that dimensionally lends itself and shoot really high quality match bullets but all of these are still here no matter what mm -hmm. combination of that you choose and you're going to get all these in a random combination right it's just trying to to find the way to minimize them as, as best you can. Mm -hmm. And and we see that in that proof of what you just laid out. I mean, you look at the guys in the, you know, the, especially the short range bench rest game, that's where the smallest groups are ever produced really, you know, um, like there's the article about the, the, the warehouse in Houston, super cool article. I mean, those guys are talking about shooting tiny, itty bitty little groups with a controlled environment and all this kind of stuff. Why is that happening? Because they're selecting components and probably methods that are supporting these things we just talked about. They're minimizing principal axis tilt. They're selecting, you know, bullets that have a minimal amount of center of gravity offset. Yeah, thin jackets probably. And probably both by design and manufacture, you know, um, the barrels that they're shooting. And you compare all that to, say, a 1960s era budget hunting rifle 300 wind mag yeah well, that has a pencil thin barrel and the fit between the barrel and the receiver and the threads and all this other additional stuff that's happening is good enough you yep. know where on the other end of the spectrum it's as perfect as you can make it so yeah. when you get the you would expect to get better results with that bentress system than you would that other system but it it doesn't ignore these facts it actually uses them to support why those two systems perform that much differently yeah, 
couple follow-ups with that. One, I looked up some analytics uh, on short-range bench rest here. This has been a bunch of years ago, so I've gone smell blind since then. But every single one of them shot the same cartridge, used the exact same powder, and used a boutique brand of bullets. Some of them used different brands of bullets, but like the top 20 in the nation, mm -hmm. uh, they all were shooting 6BR. They were all shooting like a sub-80 grain bullet. Uh, they were all using Vitavori N133, and I'd never heard of a single one of their bullet manufacturers. <laughs> yeah, uh, they're super, custom guys. Yep, yeah. so super, super small. I wonder what their barrel lengths are is what I was thinking. Yeah. Because one would think, you know, velocity is of no concern of mine if I'm shooting to 300 yards. You'd think you'd want a heavy contour, short barrel. Mm -hmm. um, that's it, yeah. Well, there, there's a good point there, and one that I didn't bring up earlier when we were talking about muzzle exit condition. So the, the fad has always been, especially in the tactical worlds, to go to a shorter barrel. Right? Yeah. Because it's lighter. Well, you're a, I'm, I'm a short I'm barrel. calling the kettle black here. here. Um, there's trade-offs that happen with this shorter barrel. Sure. And we should do twist rate too. Don't let me forget that. Um, so with the shorter barrel, as you cut that thing back, uh, the muzzle blast pressure is going to increase. It essentially has to, unless you're going from like a 40-inch barrel to a 35-inch barrel. Yeah. Okay, your muzzle blast pressure probably isn't going to change much but let's say within the realm of reason you go from a 24 to a 20 or a 16 to a 14 or to a 12 or to a 10 or to a 7 yeah. which we've all seen in the 556 five, world yep and what happens when we do that is the muzzle blast is substantially more aggressive the propellant in many cases hasn't burned yeah. out properly so now you've got the ejecta along with the gas chasing yeah. the bullet out yeah you're burning or partially you know i think seward had brought that up on that podcast that you have you know partially burning or unburnt propellant granules coming out and those things have mass and they're smacking into the back of the bullet that's not good right the bullet right. can move and if the bullet moves it's not going if it moves the same way every time you're good yeah what are the odds of that yeah and so we've also there's another cool test that i remember a long time ago reading in uh, harold vaughn's book rifle accuracy facts he did an experiment where he took bullets and he drilled a hole in the side of them to give them a known amount of center gravity offset. Essentially, this is, this happens a lot in like design or, or uh, experimentation where you know there's these level of error, but they're so small that you can't measure them. And so you just make them worse on purpose to yeah. the point where you can measure them and then you just kind of scale or extrapolate back or interpolate back to what the value should be at the level it naturally occurs at. And so he drilled these holding bullets and he has this documented in his book. Great book if you haven't read it. Good resource. Um, but we did it here. Like, why not? Yeah. Let's, let's see what see happens if we do it. And so we drilled, we took some uh, CXs because it's easy to, to drill those and you don't have to worry about like integrity, you know? Oh yeah. Because um, they're monolithic material. And so we drilled holes in the side of them and we indexed them when we chamber them. So we, we drilled the hole in the bullet and then when we loaded it in the cartridge case, we made a line down the cartridge case. And then when we chambered it in the, in the firearm, we, you know, the, for the first five of them or whatever, we chambered them all with the line up at 12 o'clock. We shot those. And then the next five, we chambered them with the line pointing to the right at three o'clock. Shot those. And lo and behold, guess what we found? There was four different groupings on the target. Wow. From those. It was so cool to see, right? You yeah. read these things or study them or whatever it may be, and then you replicate it and it does exactly what, what happened. It's kind of cool. Um, but so the, the point there is that the nature of that is random. Your bullet has some level of center gravity offset. It's going to have some level of principal axis tilt, likely, but you can't control it, and you don't know what orientation they're in. If you could, you would shoot the one whole group. Yeah. Um, and the 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 barrel length issue is 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 something to keep in mind there, because a sure. lot of guys want to go shorter, all for the ease of use, um, from a size standpoint. But what they don't understand is there's a trade off associated there, and so you're likely going to have an increase in dispersion if you're cutting barrels back that's not a universal term there's you can get away with cutting a barrel back and there'll be no dispersion increase but on average you'll see it sure especially if you start to cut it back far enough that the propellant isn't fully burning out yet right you get increased muzzle flash you get increased fouling with suppressors i've seen suppressors blow up yeah because detonation. they cut the barrel so short that those things are getting loaded up with unburnt propellant and eventually that thing lets go um not good seven inch five five sixes yeah 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 um, so the center of gravity thing in particular, but also the principal axis thing, uh, are sensitive to twist rate. So we talked about the car tire out of balance and the faster you drive, the worse the out of balance gets. Mm -hmm. 
And we talked about that from the perspective of the, the bullet's acceleration down bore. Well, what also happens is within the same cartridge ammo combination, if you decide to go to a faster twist rate, that has it's to get worse. worse. The bullet's spinning faster, although the acceleration, all that stuff may be identical. And so in general, the imperfections that you have in your bullet are going to be exacerbated by twist rate. Now, that doesn't mean that every single seven twist barrel is going to shoot worse dispersion than every eight twist barrel. But on average, you can see it. We, we've seen it a lot yeah. in testing. Yeah, I think back to the old Hummer, the original eight and a half yep. twist Bartland yep. that you built in, gosh, the year of our Lord, 2014, yeah. maybe? Yeah, it was a while ago. I don't know how many thousands of rounds that thing has on it, but it, it ate every single bullet from any manufacturer ever made. Mm -hmm. Probably one of the more forgivingly accurate barrels I've ever been around. Yeah, it's not dead yet. Allegedly. No, I almost killed it when I stuck a bullet in it oh, over yeah. Thanksgiving, but I got it out. <laughs> yeah. yeah my, oh, yeah, you melted it with the I used, wipeout, right? Yeah, I used patch out. I, it sat there for a month before it finally ate through the jacket far enough that I could knock it oh, back out. Wow. But yeah. She's still alive. She's still going. Good. Yeah, I think it's an M40 Contour Bartland 5R, and yeah, yeah eight and a half inch twist, and that was shooting, it would shoot 147s, shoot 140s, shoot 135s, it would shoot 130s, 123s, 120s. Yeah. You gotta be a little careful, listeners out there. Uh, don't just go buy an eight and a half twist barrels because you hear this. Because you have to be careful with your gyroscopic stability. Oh yeah. Well, and uh, Jaden's uh, whole job, your whole career has been revolved around research and development. Yeah. And you know that was more of an experiment than anything else. Is yeah, you gotta go out there and test some stuff. Uh, but likewise, we've done uh, several guns in the lab. When I was still working with you, we had a bunch of prefit barrels cut here in house. Seven, seven and a half, eight, eight and a half, and that seven twist barrel. I don't remember exactly, but I don't recall it shooting particularly great. Mm -hmm. uh, all, all things equal compared to the other barrels. Yeah, that yeah. is a good point. And again, that's one variable of so, so many. many. We only yeah. talked about those four here, and just keep that in mind that if you just take a simple approach to it, four different variables, each which could be good or bad, making them into eight. That's that results in seventy different combinations, yeah. and that's really breaking it down because there's that there, there's a scale between good and bad it's not oh like, it's not yeah. black and white yeah, the magnitude scale. varies yep and the direction varies and you know it it's a giant mess yes it is and <laughs> uh another thing that we didn't touch on at all uh in relation to dispersion is propellant mm -hmm. and there's a lot of unknowns there a lot of speculation and i know we have our own opinions but there are man there are some powders that it, it doesn't matter what you're shooting. If it works, just use that one. Yep. Uh, so powder type. And uh, I, th I would, in my opinion, powder type has more of an influence on dispersion than anything else to do with powder. Like powder charge, anything else. It's single based extruded powders, for whatever reason, they just plain work for accuracy. Yep. And uh, th there are some new ball powders out on the market that are significantly better than some of the old ones. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, at any charge weight, a single based extruded powder and some double base powders from Alliant here recently, uh, they just they're 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 amazing. Mm -hmm. They're magic. Yeah, they can't fix bad bullets. Center no. gravity's way no. off. Yeah, they can't fix barrel problems. <clears throat> barrel problems, excuse me. So dimensional changes down bore, dramatic lack of bore straightness combined with contours that support a lot of. Uh, barrel pointing variability i mean powder isn't the one fix all but no. if you do like we like we've talked about before if you get good components barrel bullet powder you know mm -hmm. the main three like we've said if you get good components that have proven themselves and have a reputation you're probably going to have a good result yep so um but i mean what's your take on all this so 11 year old seth that's yeah. getting frustrated because the old 257 bob isn't putting them all in the same hole like yeah when when you started to learn this stuff did it have the same impact on you as it did on me yeah it was it's it is like oh oh so i'm not crazy so i'm not you know clicking my scope you know getting ready for hunting season making two click adjustments it just had no idea what i was doing it's it's again it's like a like a drink of water like oh okay that's refreshing to see yeah uh and it's remarkable we even hit anything yeah you know, when you think about it, especially I think back to, you know, we talked about the 300 PRC, forget what podcast, but we did a whole deep dive on the 300 PRC. And I remember being out on the long range and we were shooting groups. We didn't start until 1640. 
it's ridiculous. And you're shooting groups at six. You're not just like, oh, I hit a piece of steel a few times. Like, right. we're shooting groups at 1640, 1800, 2000 yards. It's amazing you can hit what you're aiming at with any consistency when you consider all of these variables. Yeah, it it, it is wild that we can be as successful as we are with uh, little humps of metal yeah. flying down metal garden hoses yep. a, into some unknown environment. Yeah, you know? yeah. and as soon as you pull the trigger, your barrel just turns into an inflatable wacky arm filling <laughs> tube, man. Uh, <laughs> yeah. One thing yeah, it does. I wanted to bring up before we wrap this podcast up, we referenced a bunch of stuff, and I feel like now's the time to have the listeners get a piece of paper and a pen and let's hear the Quinlan's Corner recommended reading list. Oh, we've referenced a, bu- a couple books here and over the last several months of ballistic podcast, mm-hmm. you know, we've, we've referenced a lot of books. So is there a Quinlan's Corner recommended reading list? The, there, it, there is, but you're tapping my memory, which is okay. not strong. So I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you what I got. Though. Okay. Yeah. If you miss any that I know of, I'll recommend them. The, the number one, Broad application, most impactful, was Seawert's book, okay. Ammunition Demystified. Yep, Ammunition Demystified, Jeff Seawert. It's available on Amazon. Yep. Uh, it's, you can get it digitally or hardback. The next one, for me particularly, that I wanted to dig in and understand why was McCoy's Modern Exterior Ballistics. Mm-hmm. Um, and that one's probably rivaled with Harold Vaughn's Rifle Accuracy Facts. And I've heard some like spatterings of controversy over his test data or whatever, but super interesting book nonetheless. Yeah, I nonetheless, mean, it's I mean, a page turner. He goes into like the the effects of the thread angle engagement between the barrel and the receiver and the impact that has. I mean, it yeah. gets in the weeds. We, yeah, um, and I'm yeah. He outlined like you know you cut your thread tenon, you know, like on a rim, uh, Remington seven hundred style thread tenon. Ninety percent of the work is handled by whatever it was, like the three threads closest to the, the to the face, yeah. the shoulder. Yeah. And you yeah. have that, you know, inch long tendon or whatever. Yeah. There was um there was a black and red book. Yep. Uh Rinker, yep. maybe. I think it was Robert Rinker. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember the title. Something Understanding about ballistics. ballistics, I think. Or, yeah. Something like that. That book is pretty good, especially uh It's an older book. It's yeah, it's an older book. There was some stuff in there, I think, that was incorrect. I mean, there always, like, even in McCoy's book, there's been corrections that have come out and said, like, this was wrong or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you're not going to, like, crucify every little mistake that you read and you can take it with a grain of salt, um, that that one's pretty decent for a broad-level understanding. Yeah, I think it was Understanding Firearm Ballistics, Robert Rinker. Yeah, um, Carlucci's book is a good one. It's it's uh, heavy, like McCoy's book. Sure. Um and there's a lot of good information that's released from um, BRL or AR, ARL from the Army, the, okay. like Aberdeen Proving Ground, the Army yeah. Research Labs. I mean, uh, there's the the DTIC articles that you can find. You know, if you, if you want to try to find that stuff, just maybe type in on a internet search engine DTIC, D-T-I-C. Yeah, DTIC.mil. And, uh, and ballistics or whatever, and you'll get a pile of stuff. And, and there's varying degrees there of, I mean, some of the coolest stuff I've ever read was like 1960s, 70s to like the 80s. Yeah. Like incredible stuff they're coming out with. Um, there's great stuff that's that's put out really all over. I mean, well, uh, now with the information age and podcasts and and all kinds of stuff. But as far as hardback books go that you can physically have, yeah, uh, I think you nailed a bunch of them. The ones that I were gonna was going to feed you if you forgot. Uh, you you talked about. And, yeah, the Harold Vaughn book, uh, Rifle Accuracy Facts. If you've got like a three-hour flight, just just go ahead and get that book. Now, unfortunately, to get an actual physical copy in your hand is a little bit pricey because mm-hmm. they haven't published it in a while. And the last time I saw them, they're about two hundred fifty bucks. Yeah, but uh, if you get a hold of a copy or get it digitally for a three-hour flight, it is a page turner. Yeah, because uh, he writes it very digestibly. Mm-hmm. But we shouldn't forget that book either. You know, the, oh, absolutely. The, our our, our uh, handbook of reloading. So the first hundred pages of that I know I highlighted thirteen through thirty. That's the section I think titled "Firing of a Cartridge." Some good information in there. Um, but those first hundred pages, if you're just getting into it, they have some really good information in there. And and I'm sure other reloading handbooks too. Sure. Um, you know, I haven't looked at at many of the others recently or read you know kind of their informational stuff in there, but you know. This this industry's got some very smart people in it, and, and that information 
isn't groundbreaking today. We're kind of, we're definitely standing on our forefathers. You know, yeah. So absolutely. Well, standing hopefully. on their shoulders, not standing on them. That's yeah, that sounds weird. Sorry. But we're standing on their shoulders and hopefully getting the this information to a new group of shooters and and you know hobbyists that are passionate about it just as we were mm -hmm. uh that may not be familiar with it yeah. um it's yeah same information but getting it to a new consumer that uh you know is consuming information digitally like on a podcast for example but check those books out Jaden. in the world of bullet dispersion is there anything else that you want to you want to send off before we close this one out i don't I don't think so. Um, I think I think as universal as dispersion is, I I think this is more applicable. Some some of our podcasts have kind of tailored to the long range stuff, mm -hmm. like this we said, because it highlights it those principles better. But this is applicable to everybody because the the guy that's going to a USPSA championship, he's concerned with dispersion, and so is the guy at a trap shoot, and so is the bench rest on to any other yeah. long range discipline guys. So. so is the the kid shooting squirrels in the backyard. Yeah. And it'll be cool to see how this information is is received. I'm interested to see that, you know, because yeah. as time's progressed this information has become more available. So I'm curious to see like what's the ratio of a people that they've never heard anything like this before and what's the ratio of people that were aware of it or maybe very experienced in it. That'll be yeah. cool to see. That will be. Uh and then you know, there's more to it than this. This was a very simple overview. It's like way more complex than this. There, yeah. You know, you could start to get into the jump diagrams. So jump diagrams, real quick before we stop. Oh are, boy. Are pretty cool. So a jump diagram is essentially a roadmap of how the bullet got to where it did. And so from the starting point, which is the barrel's position at, at uh, with with no harmonic or movement or cross velocity effects and then what were the effects of that where here's where the bullet came out but the barrel was in motion in this direction here and then from here to here is due to the center of gravity offset and from here to here is due to aerodynamic jump and from here to here is this and this it's like you just follow this road map and oh that's how you get to the bullet wow the bullet's there because oh, all these, these things, things happen yeah and so you can you can look that up on a search engine on the internet uh, uh the jump diagram aerodynamic jump diagram or just projectile jump diagram it's pretty cool to see that yep that'll have to wait for another day and probably another person because as for me i'm just going to assume all my bullets go in the same hole if yep. i do my part march on march on <laughs> <laughs> everybody hopefully you enjoyed this episode of Linland's corner as always Jaden, thanks for coming on yep. and we'll catch you guys on the next one